Taylor Riggs in San Francisco in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, WeWork Rework. The office-based rental company reworks its initial public offering conditions, but is it enough to calm investors' nerves before the big roadshow begins next week? Plus, much fan flair. Cloudflare jumps in its trading debut after raising $525 million. Who says all unicorn IPOs aren't magical? We hear from Cloudflare's CEO. And genetic code of ethics. In our medical technology series, Wired for Health, we sit down with the co-inventor of CRISPR to discuss gene editing technology, moral considerations, and the future of fighting disease. But first to our top story, WeWork has picked NASDAQ as the venue for its embattled listing. The office leasing startup also is making changes to its corporate governance to address investor concerns. Among them, no member of co-founder Adam Newman's family will sit on the board. At one point, WeWork was valued at around $47 billion. Now it's expected to be worth about $15 billion in the IPO. To discuss, I'm joined by Boardspan CEO Abby Adlerman and in New York, Jillian Taylor who has been covering the story for us. So Jillian, let me just start with you. How shocked were you that they're really doing this IPO? So if you read Bloomberg, you shouldn't be shocked. I think we broke on Tuesday night. I think it was, or Thursday, I'm losing track of days. This week's going crazy, but we broke this week that the company was weighing corporate governance changes to salvage the IPO because tepid demand from investors had sort of caused the advisors and the company to rethink how they could improve things and corporate governance was what they landed on. So not too shocked this morning to see it. Um, yeah, the changes, I guess, were a little bit maybe more drastic than we were thinking. There were quite a lot of changes. I'm not sure if you want me to rattle through them quickly, but there's going to be a lead directed by year end. The high vote rights from Adam Newman will go from 20 back to 10 and eventually to one in the event of his death. Um, and the, the board will actually be able to choose his successor, not just right. his wife and two directors. So, Abby, you heard Jillian really talk us through those corporate governance changes. From your perspective, is that enough? Well, I think that is exactly the question that investors are going to be asking and governance gurus as well. If you think about it, is this a step in the right direction when they really need a leap? And I think the key thing to think about is the responsibilities of the board and really what they're going to have to lean into once the company goes public. What more would you like to see? Right. So I think the big issue that's still out there and on people's minds is the level of control that Adam Newman still has. If you look at the three different classes of stock, he's got that super voting. And while they did bring it down from 20 to 10 as a ratio, he also has extra voting through his uh, C Series C. Um, and as a result, he will still be able to appoint who's on the board, even though the board does have more power than it used to have. What else would you like to see? What other changes do you think would be appropriate in this case? Well, there is some talk about more diversity, and there was a statement in the newly filed uh, S-1 that they're going to continue to increase the diversity of the board. Uh, but until you see how they're going to do that, um, it's still a question mark for people. Jillian, let me bring you back in here. It was so interesting to me because we talked about corporate governance changes being enough for investors. But frankly, a lot of the concerns on our end were an income statement that you can't understand and there's no path to profitability. Is it a corporate governance problem or a financial problem? I think it's a little bit of both. We've been reaching out to investors today to sort of gauge their feedback. Some early feedback has been that simply these corporate gov governance changes are not going to be enough for some investors who are very focused on the financial performance of the company who can't see a roadmap to positive cash flow anytime soon and so who simply won't be participating based on that. Jillian, any sense of what investors this does not go far enough for? Um, no, like as soon as we get some, you'll be reading about it on the Bloomberg Terminal or Bloomberg.com this weekend. If anyone wants to get in touch with me, feel free. My Twitter DMs are open. Um, the other thing I would point out is that we expect the roadshow to launch as soon as Monday. And um, you would have seen in our reporting today that SoftBank is actually in talks to invest $750 million into the IPO, which at $3 billion would represent 25% of the IPO. So they'll minimize their dilution if that happens. 
Right. You know, Abby, you were nodding your head when we were talking about if this was a corporate governance problem or a yeah. financial problem. Which is it? Yeah, I think Jillian's got it right on this one, that it is a bit of both. If you think about the role of the board, and this is something at Boardspan we talk about all the time, what is the purpose of the board? It's first and foremost oversight and accountability. And as I said earlier, Adam Newman will still appoint who's on the board. Mm -hmm. So how much can they do their job and push hard on that oversight and accountability responsibility? Second to that is risk management. And third, if they get all that other stuff done, is their contributions to strategy. Uh, Abby or Jillian, let me bring you back in here. You mentioned the road show. What's the biggest question you have on the road show on Monday? I mean, where the valuation stands and where it's going to sort of rise. And that's, I think, you know, they'll have five to nine days ish if they try to go public by Friday of the following week, which would allow Adam to observe Rosh Hashanah, which is a Jewish holiday and he's quite observant. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, the time crunch is kind of interesting. It's a shorter roadshow than we've seen for some other companies like Peloton's roadshow. Small, they're raising a lesser amount of money, but they've already launched the roadshow and it'll be probably longer than the WeWork Roadshow, so all eyes, all eyes on the next 10, 9 to 10 days. Yeah, Abby, let me just end with you, with you here, sort of on a broad look at the composition of these boards. You mentioned the role of the board is to hold the CEO accountable. You don't have that really with Elon Musk and Tesla. You don't really have that with Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Is this sort of a broader tech problem where you don't have, you have these great visionary leaders, but is the board really holding them accountable? You know, it's really interesting that you are associating it primarily with the tech industry, right? Because that is such a, you know, sort of heart and soul of the San Francisco Bay Area. And what's, what's really driving this, I believe, are the relationships that these CEOs have with their investors before they go public. Mm -hmm. And, you know, call it uh, who needs who more, the, the venture capital investor or the CEO, or maybe it's just really, you know, on a less cynical note, a trusting relationship. Mm -hmm. However, these uh, governance uh, problems and mm -hmm. these challenges that we're seeing are born out of the relationships that are established when the companies are private. And I think there's some work to be done there. We await the Roadshow Monday. That was Boardspan CEO Abby Adlerman and Bloomberg's Jillian Tan. Now, I want to stay with WeWork and talk about how it's impacted SoftBank's not-so-great week. SoftBank has put more than $10 billion into WeWork and is a key financer of businesses in the gig economy. On Tuesday, the California legislator passed a labor bill that could force gig economy companies to incur substantial new employment costs and dramatically reshape their business models. That affects SoftBank's investment in Uber and stakes in DoorDash and the dog walking app WAG. So to discuss the rough week that SoftBank has endured, I'm joined by Bloomberg Technologies, Lizette Chapman. So Lizette, frankly, walk me through this. Let's start with WeWork. What was SoftBank's reaction, do we know, to this WeWork IPO? You know, that's not something that, um, you know, I reported on in, in, in my story. That's something I'm sure, you know, Jillian, as we've just talked about, you know, is going to be continuing to report, um, you know, over the next over the next week or so. I mean, it's definitely not going to be good. We can know that. If you invest in a company at $47 billion and just a few months later, it looks like it's going to be worth, you know, anywhere from 10 to $15 billion is what we're hearing. Um, that's that's not a good look. It's especially difficult for SoftBank right now because it's working to raise a second massive fund, SoftBank Vision Fund 2. And um, it's, you know, not not a great time to go to investors when some of your, for, for, for re-up, when some of your initial bets have fallen so flat. Not only WeWork, but as you mentioned, all of these gig economy companies that are affected by this new California state law, which has a history of setting precedent across the nation. So ultimately, the cost could be significant for WeWork, or excuse me, for SoftBank. Right. So talk to me more about SoftBank's uh, reaction to Uber or Lyft. You mentioned that Assembly Bill 5. Any impact on the economy? Any concern there about how this could affect them? Right. There is a major concern. Um, some analysts that we've talked to have put the price increase to Uber and to Lyft at around 30 percent, um, you know, for for these additional payments for health benefits and maternity and paternity leave and the like, um, if they are forced to reclassify their employees, um, you know, their independent contractors as employees. So again, it's going to there, there's questions around the valuation and some of the financial assumptions around WeWork, um, you know, 
know, as you just discussed in the previous segment, um, you know, there are a lot of people having having a trouble getting getting comfortable with some of those those assumptions that there's no path to profitability forward, or it's a, or it's a sketchy one. And then the second one is is kind of the looseness that 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 SoftBank has played um, with some of these emerging business models that rely on things, um, you know, like in the gig economy of, of classification of workers and being able to scoop out that 30 percent as something they don't have to pay. Um, you know, definitely affected the way that they valued it and the way that they approach not only their investment in Uber, but also, you know, in DoorDash and, and the dog walking app uh, WAG as well. Bloomberg Technologies, Lizette Chapman, thank you for joining me. All things SoftBank. Coming up, hurry up on Huawei. That is the U.S. chipmaker industry message to the U.S. government. We look at their plea to keep on selling to the banned Chinese company next. This is Bloomberg. U.S. chipmakers have a message for President Donald Trump. Hurry up and let us sell to Huawei. A semiconductor lobbying group sent the Trump administration a letter asking the president to make good on his promise to ease the ban on sales to the Chinese telecom giant. That's because American companies need special permission to supply Huawei following a U.S. blacklist. Joining me to discuss in Los Angeles, Bloomberg trade reporter Sarah McGregor. And with me in studio, my own, our own, Ian King, who covers the chip industry for us. Sarah, let me just start with you. How likely is it, from your perspective, that we could get maybe an easing back on some of that ban? So we reported earlier this week that the Trump administration's considering an in interim deal with China, something that could just sort of unfreeze the conflict right now. What's not clear is whether that interim deal will still include Huawei special licenses. Of course, Trump himself has promised, and he said to President Xi Jinping face to face, that he was going to try and ease that ban. He told chipmakers the same thing in July, yet we haven't heard a thing about it. We haven't seen a single special license be issued to a U.S. company despite pressure from them, despite the promises. And so it really does look like the Trump administration's holding this out as leverage. It knows that how important Huawei is to the Chinese government, that it's a real ace in its back pocket in these talks. And it's hard to see right now if they're going to give up that leverage, if they're going to trade that away so easily. So Ian, what companies are involved? What do they want? Yeah, I mean, there's a, any number of companies. You, as you know, the, uh, China is the largest market for U.S. Mm -hmm. semiconductor makers. So you, you name it, you know, Intel, AMD, Xilinx, you know, companies that you've never even heard of, that they need this access, and, and Huawei is a big customer for them. That's not to say that they haven't been supplying Huawei in, in the interim. Of course, there was the initial reaction, there was the initial shutdown. Then they looked at some of the rules and regulations and found out, you know what, we can actually sell quite a lot of what we have to Huawei regardless of this clampdown and have continued to do so. But this would really make the situation much more stable and this is really what they want. Sarah, aren't these companies, though, also worried about IP theft? Doesn't some of this get around that issue of protecting your data? Absolutely, but I think what the chip makers are arguing is that the products that they're selling to Huawei, these specific products that they want the special licenses for, aren't national security concerns. And so, you know, for one, Huawei's on this this trade blacklist, of course, for these concerns. You know, link whether it's links uh, potentially to the PLA or other activities like spying by the company that the U.S. alleges and Huawei vehemently denies. Um, you know, th these companies are saying that they're not caught up in these sort of allegations. That's not part of what the, the problem is. And so I think, uh, you know, for them, it just doesn't make sense. And at the time, you know, according to them, according to this letter that they've written to Secretary Ross, and they've said repeatedly, the longer that they lose their link to Huawei, the worse it becomes for them. Their profits are lowered, they have less money for research, and they lose some of their global dominance. Their foreign competitors do not have the same restrictions to selling to this company, and it's just really chipping away at, at these companies' um, dominance right now in the global marketplace. So, Ian, that sort of brings me to my next point, because we were on the Broadcom earnings call, and they sort of hinted at what Sarah was pointing out, where they're being hurt by Huawei, but Apple's a bright spot. How much can you see other companies sort of offset or overcompensate some of the losses that they're getting from Huawei? Um, 
They, they can and they can't. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, as an individual entity, this company is the third biggest buyer of chips in the world, mm -hmm. so that doesn't go away. Obviously, it's getting chips from somewhere. I think, the, to, to echo Sarah's point, the biggest concern for U.S. companies in particular, say, let's take the example of Micron. Micron can't sell Huawei a memory chip. If it can't do that, well, then Huawei just goes and buys it from Samsung. It's not hurting Huawei. It's not, it's not strengthening this US's position against China, not hurting anybody apart from Micron. That's what they're saying. And that's something that they really can't make up for. As it relates to China, you had another great story out today talking about the funding environment for startups. Do they just avoid China altogether? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it was really an interview with one guy. And he was saying in the past, you know, he had already taken investments from China. And in his mind, there was, there was nothing wrong with that. It was just another investor. Now, though, you have to be careful. Now, though, you don't want to risk having somebody investing in you who gets put on an entity list who has security concerns because that could destroy your whole business. So in his mind, that changes the whole equation. You have to go after domestic money. You have to produce things domestically. That's more expensive. And outside domestic in China, are there other countries that are now being able to take advantage of this and invest, given you can't necessarily right now for optics reasons yeah. go to China for money? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of sovereign wealth funds out there mm -hmm. from companies that, you know, from countries rather that have a, you know, in interesting relationships and interesting reputations internationally. He said you have to be careful of those. But I think the best example he gave was, well, maybe naturally we would have gone to China. The world's second largest economy is an international expansion, but we're not. We're going to Japan. Well, all things China and trade, Bloomberg's Ian King and Sarah McGregor, thank you for joining me. And coming up, the year of the tech IPO continues. This time, software maker Cloudflare hits the public market. Our conversation with the company's CEO, next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology. Be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. And now to a developing story. We have learned that Disney CEO Bob Iger has resigned from Apple's board. This happened on September 10th, and that comes from an SEC filing. Iger is stepping down as Apple is becoming a direct competitor to Disney in the streaming space. Now, Cloudflare rose as much as 30% in its trading debut, improving momentum for unprofitable companies going public at valuations in the billions of dollars with other large IPOs ahead. Bloomberg's Nabila Ahmed spoke with Cloudflare CEO Matthew Prince from the New York Stock Exchange. We were really uh, had a great team behind us, both at Cloudflare and then the advisors uh, and investors and bankers that we were been able to work with. And so you're always you're always nervous going from a private company to a public company. But I think we were we were really well prepared, and and we're in this not for any short-term performance, but how we're going to build a really enduring business that can fulfill our mission of of really helping build a better internet. Investor perception of tech growth stocks. How did you find that during the roadshow? No, I think that there's there's been volatility in the market in the short term, and and there will be volatility that we live through. Um, that's the nature of markets. I, uh, you know, I, I I'm really it has been fun for me today because my dad was a stockbroker growing up, and I watched you know the floor of the New York Stock Exchange all my life, and I think that the great companies are those that can execute over the long term, and I think we have a a really big uh, potential opportunity and we want to build what is an enduring company over the long term. You've been plowing money into growth but at what point do you turn to profits? You know, I think that we, the year before you go public is a very special year for you to make sure that you've got all the systems and processes in place so that you can have real stability. And so we invested a lot in 2018 into our GNA uh, resources in order to make sure that we had stability in our business and that we had the IT infrastructure and the accounting infrastructure to be a public company. And and so we're, we're confident that we'll be able to continue to execute and that this is a, a really big market and that we'll be able to uh, uh, be, a, be a company that, that can thrive in the long term. 
You have a tough job with some of your customers, you know, protecting the public from things like white supremacy, terrorism. You have banned a couple of those. What's a decision-making process behind that? You know, I think when we started Cloudflare, we, we realized that what we were competing with was the on-premise hardware by companies like Cisco, F5, those sorts, of, uh, those sorts of businesses. And the reality is that bad content flows through those boxes all the time. And it would be strange if they were making a determination on what content was good or bad. And so we've always been very reticent about playing the role of internet content arbiter. But sometimes there is content that is just so abhorrent, and there are platforms that are designed from the beginning to be lawless. And in those cases, sometimes we have to step in and make those decisions. But largely our team is, is really uh, dedicated to working with public policy officials and law enforcement officials. The FBI has been a Cloudflare customer for a really long time because they know that we have great data on who the bad guys are online, how to stop them, and that fundamentally is what we do every day, protecting our customers against literally more than 44 billion cyber attacks on a daily basis. Matthew, you operate in more than 90 countries around the world, China among them, where you have a partnership with Baidu. Negotiations on that partnership are coming up next year. How are the trade talks and the tension between uh, US and China affecting that? So we, we just renewed our partnership with Baidu as of September 1st, and they have been a terrific partner for us over the last five years. I don't think we've seen any uh, challenges from either the U.S. or the Chinese side in that partnership so far. And I think what we've proven is that we can be a good partner in China, which for a company of our size and scale is very unique in our business. What's powerful about Cloudflare is if you care about any market in the world, we can provide you a consistent platform, including across China, to be able to provide that. And so uh, what I actually thought is, has been interesting is that as the Chinese economy has slowed down, what that's actually resulted resulted in is Chinese companies looking for ways to expand outside of China. And so we've worked with some of the biggest Chinese brands now to make sure that they can sell their products into India, into Brazil, into other markets. And ultimately, while in the short term there might be tensions around, around various countries, um, over the long term, you know, the U.S. is an enormous market, China is an enormous market, and, and I think that there's a real opportunity to help facilitate trade uh, in the long term. And so, so in, the, in the long term, I think it's it's going to be fine. In the short term, we haven't seen any, any, uh, any challenges. That was Cloudflare CEO Matthew Prince. It's another step in the electric and connected car shift that's changing the auto industry. Volkswagen is unifying its fragmented IT units with an investment of as much as $8 billion. That will make it easier for the world's largest car maker to share parts and technology across a dozen brands. And coming up, it was a big week for tech. From Apple's event day to the U.S. government cracking down on Silicon Valley's giants. Those stories next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Technology, I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. U.S. lawmakers aren't letting up in their investigations into whether big tech is, well, too big. Earlier this week, Bloomberg learned that the U.S. Federal Trade Commission was looking at Amazon, trying to figure out if it's squeezing out smaller businesses. We also got more details at the nationwide probe into Google. It's now the House antitrust panel's turn to do some digging. Multiple committees sent letters to top execs at Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. Their demands? Detailed information about acquisitions, business practices, executive communications, previous probes, and lawsuits. Joining me to discuss this and all of the other topics in This Week in Tech. It's Eric Ross, Chief Investment Strategist at Cassend Securities. Eric, thanks for joining me. Let's talk first about antitrust and all of this big tech. Do you feel that regulatory scrutiny here is justified? 
Absolutely. I mean, so the, these companies, Google, Facebook, et cetera, they're essentially the broadcast networks of our time, except for they can see through the TV into our homes. They can see everything about it. I was actually looking at memes with my daughter last night, and somebody said that uh, Facebook doesn't need to get your resume because they already know everything about you. So, yes, <laughs> there's clearly uh, an issue that, that's here. And the problem that, I, that I'm finding, though, is there's so many different issues that are being looked at by uh, FTC, by the state attorney generals, by the House Judiciary Committee. There's all kinds of different levels. levels. There's the anti-competitiveness, there's the privacies, mm -hmm. uh, et, et cetera. So, so there's a lot of things to juggle from a legal standpoint for, for a number of these companies. And, uh, well, so you mentioned the legal standpoint. So from your financial analysis, can you talk about just massive legal fees, or is there a real impact or real threat to the business lines that could impact the bottom line? I mean, it depends on which company you're talking about, but if you're talking about Facebook and Google and Apple, I mean, they're generating so much cash that the legal fees are gonna be a pretty minor uh, impact to the, to the bottom lines. Most of them are buying back their stock anytime it dips, so they're able to kind of make that up on an EPS standpoint. So I don't think that we're really gonna see legal fees as being a, mm. a giant driver of things. If you think about it, Qualcomm has been fighting with Apple now, not as much anymore, uh, for years and years and years, and that really didn't have a huge impact on the bottom line. It was really the loss of revenue. So I don't see the legal fees being an issue. Uh, you're, you're probably gonna have some payments you're gonna have to make, and mm -hmm. Facebook's $5 billion payment that they had to make was actually much lower than I think a lot of investors were expecting. So that was, that was uh, why the stock had rallied that day when that was announced. Talk to me about Tuesday. It was Apple's big event day. You yes. came out and you said that Tuesday's announcement was more surprising than you thought. You reiterated your buy on Apple with a $260 price target. What was your biggest surprise? So just to set this up, we have seen Apple for the last couple of years as really transitioning from the iPhone and being a hardware sales company to being something that's gonna be selling services. Now it's been a slow transition, but they really wanna take that install base, keep protecting it, and then sell these services into it. So this announcements on, on Tuesday were, in our opinion, more pleasantly surprising and positive uh, for that, that uh, methodology for Apple. So for instance, they did have the high-end phones that you expect, the 11 Pro, which is what they called them, but they mm -hmm. kept a, a, a cheaper phone just like the, the XR, which is just the 11, and they also kept the XR and the 8, and so that there really is a spectrum of, of devices that you can buy in order to get into the Apple ecosystem. You also had Apple TV and the Apple Games platform mm -hmm. that are both being offered for $5 a month, but uh, Apple TV is actually being offered for free for qualifying users in the platform they're buying new phones. So you do have a lot of that going on. So this is getting more people on to, into the, the platform, the install yeah. base larger, selling more services there, and sort of generating what I would call an annuity type revenue stream from the services, which is much more stable and frankly could be much higher margin. Eric, another big issue this week was uh, a preliminary look at Assembly Bill 5, which yes. would require some of those gig economies, Uber, Lyft, um, to maybe perhaps treat contract workers as employees. How much of a hit is that to those financials? Yeah, it's definitely been a big week for everybody. So that was not necessarily a surprise. It had already been going through uh, the, the California Senate, uh, and this was the House approval, and now I, I don't know if it's actually been signed into law yet, but uh, clearly Uber Uber and Lyft and the other gig economy type uh, companies are coming out and saying, and they've been saying this for a while, that the drivers, for instance, at Uber and Lyft are not employees, they're customers. And Uber is just a service which connects the, the riders with the drivers. And both are customers and both are getting uh, are paying service fees for the use of their app. So that they're gonna make that case as strongly as they can. I mean, the truth is is that it could add to their, their driver fees as much as 25, maybe 30% if it actually is pushed through, just in California, of course. Um, uh, where they actually lose a battle in court. This is gonna be years right. and years of appeals. So it's not something that's gonna happen very quickly. We also have a hold on both uh, Uber and Lyft because we don't see them generating profit anytime in the near future. So this is just another Quick problem for them. Well, and quickly talk to me about that Uber and Lyft. 
I was fascinated by your research note. You look at them as social media companies. Why? Yes. Well, actually, we look at them kind of the way they look at themselves, and we, we measure the new users the same way we'd measure a new user on Instagram or on Twitter. We measure it by looking at, is an app being downloaded? We, so this is our whole, our whole investment philosophy is actually measuring fundamental things so we can, they can tell us what to do rather than us deciding what the theme is and then coming up with some answer. So we do look at what happens on a, on a weekly and monthly basis as far as new app downloads, um, sort of page views, uh, app ratings, that type of thing for Uber and Lyft as well as a lot of other companies in that space. So the week in tech, that was a great recap. Eric Ross of Kissend Thanks so Securities. Thanks for joining me. And coming up, our medical technology series, Wired for Health, wraps up the future of gene editing and gene sequencing. We'll sit down with CRISPR co-inventor Jennifer Doudna. That's next. This is Bloomberg. All week, we brought you stories of innovations and investments in medical technology series called Wired for Health. Today, we focus on CRISPR technology. It's the powerful tool for editing genomes. In recent years, it has made quite a splash in the news for the scientific promise it brings, but it has also brought about some ethical concerns as the science and moral considerations evolve. Take a listen. 2012 is the year of a landmark discovery. It's called CRISPR. 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 CRISPR-Cas9. There's a dispute about who actually discovered this tool for editing the human genome, but now scientists can cut out faulty sections of DNA and replace them with healthy ones. It's cheap. It's easy to use. I've, I've watched people use CRISPR in a, a neighborhood laboratory, and these were folks that were no more scientists than you and I. That's exciting because that gives you all kinds of power to do experimentation. The concerns are that people might use this, say, to increase the strength of their offspring, or to choose eye color, to try to affect personality. The number of gene editing advances using CRISPR is growing worldwide, and soon China steps up its efforts to dominate the biotechnology sphere. And in 2018, this happens. Irresponsible, disturbing, inappropriate. That's how two of the inventors of a gene editing tool are describing a Chinese scientist's experiment that helped create genetically edited babies. From what I've read, he had relatively high-minded ideals about what he was doing, and I think his uh, impression was that it was going to be welcomed. The audience that he sat in front of was really pretty horrified, and eventually the Chinese government really kind of started to turn against him. The interesting thing is that every time a new technology comes along, um, everybody talks about it as though it's a Pandora's box and that these evils are going to fly out with the good. And that is, that is true. There's always risk. But that's the story of science. The whole idea is to open up these boxes and to see what's inside. And each time you open up a box, there's another box inside of it. And that's what's going to happen with CRISPR is the revelations will continue and the controversies will continue. That's just the way science goes. Here with more on this technology as well as the ethical and investment considerations surrounding it, Jennifer Doudna. She is the co-inventor of CRISPR Cas9. Welcome to Bloomberg Technology Thank you for having right me. over the bay here. So, how does this work? It's a technology for rewriting the code of life. So it works by cutting DNA and triggering cells to actually make a precise alteration to the DNA sequence in a cell, and that can propagate to an entire organism. How do you see this being able to be scaled? Could we see it be used in a large trial? What's, what's amazing about CRISPR technology is that it really affects all of biology. So it, it affects not only biomedicine, but also agriculture, synthetic biology. It's a tool that is universally able to alter DNA sequences in, uh, in cells of any kind. We saw this technology invented about six, seven years ago. Do you see it in the coming years being marketable, being able to be a sort of a real product that people could use more frequently? The amazing thing about CRISPR is that within about two years of the initial publications around this technology, there were companies that were founded. We now have several companies that are publicly traded. They're all interested in applying gene editing to solve real world problems in biomedicine and agriculture, I think we're on the verge of a, a real transformation in the field. Any timeline that you think we could see that? 
certainly in the next five years we'll see clinical trials proceeding and the outcomes are unpredictable, but we're hopeful about those. You know, it was very interesting in the introductory package. A lot of it is focused now in China. Do you feel that China is leading the way more so on this than the U.S.? It's really mixed. I mean, the amazing thing about CRISPR technology is that it's being used globally. It's widely available. It's democratizing because everybody can uh, get access to it if they want to and, and, and deploy it for, you know, for better or worse. Do you wish that maybe U.S. companies or U.S., I guess I should say companies, would be taking more of a lead here, more of a charge? I feel, I feel that at the moment, commercially, that is happening more in the U.S. than elsewhere. Talk to you, me, about the types of diseases, where we could see this. We talk about cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Where do you think if there were to be a product that was developed to cure a disease, what disease could that be in? Well, essentially any disease that has a single gene that is the genetic basis could be in principle cured using CRISPR. The challenge is how to get the CRISPR technology into the cells where it's needed. So I think the early targets will be blood diseases where we can do the editing outside the body or potentially in organs like the eye where we can deliver locally. So you said using cells outside the body. Is that really where the technology is? Do you think that we could transition where the technology could be due using cells inside the body? Absolutely. We're not there today, but that is absolutely where the field is headed. A timeline on how long you think till we get there? It depends on the new <laughs> technologies for delivery. So I think, again, we're probably looking at at least a few years from that. Do you have any regrets, if you will. You know, we talk a lot about the ethics in this space, hotly debated topic. Any sort of regrets or do-overs? No regrets, but I do think that it's important for scientists and everyone, really, to be actively engaged in the opportunities here and also the, the challenges. We need to ensure responsible use of the technology. What would you like to see from regulators uh, to make sure that we are using this technology responsibly? I'm pleased that the World Health Organization and the National Academies have worked together to put together uh, international teams of scientists who are looking into the technology and its opportunities and making, um, you know, I think some important uh, uh, guidelines that will be the basis for future regulation. And is the World Health Organization enough or do you need to see more local rules like you saw in China in that introductory where he felt like maybe he went a little bit rogue. There weren't enough controls around him on a, a more local level. Right. Well, I think we need both, really. And yeah. it's very hard to imagine how you could enforce global regulations, but I think there can be standards that are set by these international uh, groups of scientists that will set the stage for regulations locally. There has been some other ethical concerns. I'm glad that you're here so we can talk about these, about gene editing of those babies. What's the case against that? Oh, well, I think, you know, very clearly it's uh, premature to be doing that for multiple reasons. The science, the technology isn't ready for it, and also the, we haven't had the uh, conversations about the ethical implications of it either. Right. Where would you like to see those conversations go? Well, I, I would really like to see them uh, go in a direction of transparency, discussing how this t kind of technology could be used in the future to benefit human health, and also maybe where we should draw some lines. Can you talk about anything that you're doing now? I mean, you invented CRISPR six years ago or so. Any new technologies that you're really excited about now? Well, I think there are two real um, important challenges in the future for this technology to be really impactful. One is figuring out this delivery challenge we mentioned. How right. do we get editing molecules into the right cells and tissues? So we're actively working on that. We're also very interested in pushing the future of the technology by looking at ways to change the sequence of DNA in cells in a, in a precise fashion to not only disrupt genes, but also introduce new genes. When we talk about the China trade war, so much within technology and healthcare has been about IP theft and protecting your intellectual property and protecting your business. From your perspective, do you see any concerns within healthcare, healthcare technology, biotech, about protecting your IP, protecting some of that property that frankly you worked so hard for to develop? 
there always needs to be a balance between protecting IP so that commercial advancements can be made and companies and investors will want to, to invest in, in technology, but also making uh, technologies widely available for future advances. And I think that's what we see for a platform like gene editing. We want to see it widely deployed as it is, but we also want to see protections for companies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was Professor Jennifer Doudna, co-inventor of CRISPR. Now, biotech headed to Wall Street this week. The company 10X Genomics began trading at the NASDAQ Thursday under the ticker TXG. The company designs and manufactures gene sequencing technology used in scientific research, allowing users to observe gene expression on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. Now, on its first day of trading, 10X Genomics' initial share price of $39 jumped as high as 48% to $57 by the close. They settled around a bit today, but they are still above the IPO price. Joining me with more 10X Genomics CEO and co-founder Serge Saxonoff in New York. Serge, great to have you. You know, I think that the first thing that sort of struck out to me here was you're looking at a single cell basis. Walk me through why this is important. Well, the cell, the single cell is the fundamental unit of biology. Um, all of us are made up close to 40 trillion cells and they're all different. They all do different things. And what our technology has allowed the world to do is take your biological samples and actually look, analyze each individual cell, the full what's called gene expression profile of each cell across thousands to millions of cells in a single experiment. And that allowed researchers to gain all kinds of insights at the funda fundamental level of biology that shows you the true complexity of biology that was just not possible when people are looking at mixtures. When you take your biological sample, mix the contents of all the cells together, and get an average profile. Um, so the fundamental breakthroughs have just been incredible to see. What discoveries have you made so far? So I should say there was our, it's been our customers who've been making those discoveries using our tools. And it really spans just about the entirety of biological research. It's a, across the spectrum. Uh, one of the studies that I like to point to, this came out about a year ago, where researchers did a uh, kind of a foundational survey of the human and mouse lung tissue and found all kinds of interesting insights, all kinds of data, but in particular, uh, surprisingly, they found this rare cell type. No one had any idea existed. And furthermore, it turns out that that cell, that cell type, expresses the gene responsible for cystic fibrosis, one of the most common inherited diseases in the world, huge health burden, totally unexpected, totally changes our, our understanding of the disease. Many other discoveries, many other findings across cancer, uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, infectious diseases. It's actually hard to think of an area of biology where cust our customers have not made fundamental discoveries using our technology. Serge, you talked about Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and I wonder, how do you measure success? Is your success measured on when you can find a cure for those and cancers and other diseases? Yeah, I mean, you're actually getting right to the core of the mission of the company. Fundamentally, of course, there's lots of metrics how we can measure the, the growth of our business, but really, ultimately, it really comes down how close are we getting to really curing, curing diseases, curing cancer, curing Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. And uh, a proxy, like a, a, what we track internally very closely, is the other scientific discoveries coming out of our customers' labs in terms of peer-reviewed publications. Serge, we are Bloomberg after all, so I would be remiss <laughs> if I didn't mention the IPO and the financial. So congratulations on the IPO. How does your strategy change now that you're going to be scrutinized on a quarterly basis? Well, you know, uh, that's, that's a fair question. And I would say that as, as we've done from the very beginning, we're going to keep our focus in the long term. That's my orientation, I think, in terms of years and decades. And yes, <laughs> there might be some challenges with the stock price now being an indicator there that moves uh, minute by minute. But fundamentally, we're, we're, we don't plan to change the way we operate the business. It's really about the long run. And it's, it is really about enabling the world to find these cures. There was a, a patent um, suit that hit you right before the IPO. How do you respond to that? Well, you know, it's an unfortunate fact of life that our, our space, life science industry in general, has a lot of patent litigation. You know, we have our own very large IP portfolio, over 600 pending patent applications. And fundamentally, we're going to be focused on our business and really driving the growth and the execution and uh, making sure that our customers are able to do their amazing research. Growth and execution. That was Serge Saxonoff, CEO and co founder of 10X Genomics.
And coming up with Apple's new TV Plus streaming service, will it have a material impact on its finances? Apple is saying no. We have the story next. Apple said a new video service won't have a material impact on its financial results. Earlier this week, Apple outlined a strategy that involved lower prices on several devices and services, including a monthly cost of just $4.99 for TV+. Goldman Sachs analyst Rod Hall cut his price target on Apple shares to $165 from $187, saying the company's plan to offer a trial period for TV+, was, quote, likely to have a material negative impact on the average selling prices and earnings per share. AT&T's go for broke media strategy was on display again this week. The telecom giant's Warner Media has signed Star Wars director J.J. Abrams' company Bad Robot to a five-year movie and TV deal. The agreement said to be worth about $250 million, and it was made at a time when AT&T and others are launching new streaming services to address that shift from traditional TV. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology and Bloomberg Technologies live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.